This meeting is being recorded. Okay, good evening all. It's, uh, you're all very welcome to the Fermanagh Nomad District Council Policy and Resources Committee meeting this evening, Wednesday 18th of January 2023. I'm chairing the meeting from the Green Joma and others will be via WebEx. We have a few councillors in the chamber and I say others will join us via WebEx. First of all, can I wish all of you a happy new year in this year, 2023. Uh, may be a more productive and uh, positive year than we've had in 2022. I'd ask all to respect the chair and each other. We have a 12 item agenda with several reports and various items of correspondence. So I'd ask for the cooperation of all councillors to get through our meeting this evening. I'm joined in the chamber by the Chief Executive, Alison McCullough, Democratic Services Manager, Peter Donaghy, Democratic Services Officer Michelle, and from IT support, uh, we have Adam. Other officers will join us via WebEx. So thank you. Next of all, we'll go now to uh, apologies. Go to the group leaders first of all. Um, we'll go to the Sinn Féin group leader, Councillor Tommy Maguire. Uh, Guru Margaret Kearney, thank you, Chair. Uh, two apologies from the Sinn Féin group tonight, uh, Councillor Anne-Marie Fitzgerald, and Stephen McCann. Gurum Margaret, thank you, Chair. Thanks, Councillor McGuire. Now on to the Ulster Unionist Party, and I go to the group leader, Councillor Victor Warrington. Thank you, Chair. One apology from our party this evening, uh, Councillor uh, Baird. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Warrington. Now on to the Democratic Unionist Party, and it's Councillor Paul Robinson. No apologies, Chair, from the Democratic Unionist Party. Councillor Stevens, will be back later. Thank you. Now on to the Social Democratic and Labour Party and the, the group leader is Councillor Mary Gardy. Thank you and evening, Chair. Um, no apologies from our group in tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gardy. Now, uh, I know we have an, our Alliance representative in the Chamber, Councillor Donnelly. Uh, are there any apologies from the independents? Not, no indications in the chamber or on WebEx. Thank you. Item number two is to sign the minutes and confidential minutes of the previous meeting held on the 14th of December 2022, and those have already been done. Item three on our agenda is declarations of interest. Okay, uh, first up we have Councillor Josephine, Councillor Dr. Josephine Dehan via Webex. 
Good evening, Chair, and thank you. Um, I'd like to declare an interest in item 4.5, uh, 11.71 correspondence regarding primary care from Mr. Peter May. And um, I'm not sure about item 5.2, which is revision of the planning committee protocol and scheme of delegation as a member of the planning committee. Probably isn't uh, strictly necessary, but I'll make the declaration anyway, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Dr. Dehan, let's just advise you. I'm um, taking my uh, counsel from the Chief Executive here. It's not necessary to declare an interest on that matter. Thank you. Okay, well, in that case, I'll withdraw that, Chair. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Uh, next up, via WebEx, we have Councillor Roy Crawford. Thank you, Chair. I want to declare an interest in 6.3, the Fair Trade Committee. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks, Councillor Crawford. Okay, I'm not seeing anyone else. Could you just lower your hand, Councillor Crawford, please? I'm not seeing anyone else in the chamber or via WebEx. Thank you. Okay, we have one coming on the chamber now. Um, with Councillor. Can I get you on here, Councillor Donnelly? No, just hold on. Seems up some sort of a technical issue here, don't it? Just hold, hold the lane there. IT coming to the rescue here, folks. Okay, members, can we have a bit of patience, please? Uh, we have some technical issues, so we're going to pause for probably five minutes here to get this sorted. Thank you. And we're proposing and second that we do that. Councillor Stephen Donnelly, seconded. Councillor Alan Rooney, MBE. Agreed. Thank you. Oh, um, Donald's mic has come on. So try, try now. Let me see. Hello. Yeah, that's working.
pressure Hello. okay uh, we're back in the land of the loving folks uh, <laughs> so thank you to IT support for sorting that matter out for us here we have now conscious Stephen Donnelly coming on yeah uh, just declaring an interest under 4.3 as a uh, one of alliance's political nominees to the education authority thank you thank you No further declarations in the chamber or via WebEx. So we're moving on now to matters arising. And okay, start off. And this is the matters arising from the Policy and Sources Committee, Wednesday, the 14th of December 2022. And page one, page two, Chief Executive. Thank you, Chair. Just to draw members' attention to the correspondence received from the Department of Education uh, dated the 9th of January, and this is the Department's response specifically, how they view their inaction on free school means not being in contravention of the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child, and uh, the response is detailed there before members. Okay, thank you, Chief Executive. Can we put a proposal and second to note the correspondence? Opposed. Proposed by Councillor Alan Rainey, MBE, seconded by Councillor Paul Robinson uh, via WebEx. We have a speaker wanting to come on here via WebEx, and that is two speakers actually, Councillor Emmett McAleer. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, there's, there's a particular line, I think, that, that interests me or intrigues me in the, the response that we have received here um, that states that uh, should a child who is not entitled to free school meals present at school hungry, the school should, on humanitarian grounds, provide free school meals to that pupil and follow the relevant procedures. Um, follow the re relevant procedures for notifying the EA in order that they consider if further actions are necessary on welfare grounds. Now, first of all, I suppose I'm wondering, are schools aware that they can do this? And the second query I would have in relation to that is the, the, the worry that is worded could be interpreted one of two ways. It, it could be interpreted in a positive light that uh, on the grounds of the, the student's well-being that that request will be catered for. But it could also be re, re interpreted that there may be a follow-on uh, in terms of the student's home life uh, and the general welfare and well-being of that particular student or that student's family. Now, again, we raised this issue. Uh, uh, well, I raised it, and, and I'm sure other members did, uh, with the ultimate goal that our students and our young people would be looked after and that if this wasn't something that they or their families weren't going to be penalised or weren't going to be singled out or identified or embarrassed about, uh, in the hope that providing all school, free school meals to all school children, which again I note is one of the potential outcomes of the the ultimate review that's that's ongoing here, but I would maybe or I'd propose that we actually go back just to clarify that particular line, um, to clarify first of all as I say that all student or all schools are aware that this is something that they can do. I'm presuming that that it is something that they they are aware of, but secondly, just to maybe seek further clarification on the further action uh, on welfare grounds that may be taken. So I would like to just make that as a proposal, Chair, if I could. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Councillor McAleer. Uh, next up, we have Councillor Donald O'Coffey by Webex. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, um, I'm happy to second that proposal from Councillor McAleer. I was actually going to make that very same point uh, myself, but um, I, I also would like to include something else with the letter, and I'm sure other councillors are well aware of this, but I have sight of a lot of documentation now uh, uh, relating to um, the imposition of a hundred and almost 111 million pound target cut to education budgets uh, by the end of March. That is right across Northern Ireland. That's obviously the Education Authority's budget for this year tax year, which ends the end of this March. 
has to find they have to find 110 million pound now they've only found 43 million and they say they can't implement the whole 111 million 110.9 it is uh in one uh, in this next three months um but because it would actually completely breach all of their legal uh commitments and and guidelines so i i i, I know that this has uh, become a story over over the course of the day but uh this really does pose genuine concerns i'm sure to anyone uh watching how bad things is already in our education service and the idea that a conservative or tory uh representative can come over here and tell people that we have to find 110 million pounds worth of cuts by the end of march is simply unacceptable and it will have a devastating impact most worst on uh children with special educational needs because they compose the highest uh, proportion of expenditure within the education authority so i would like to ask in the correspondence going back to uh, the permanent secretary how they think that the rights of children and in particular children with special educational needs can be vindicated if they are attempting to impose such heartless devastating cuts to educational expenditure in northern ireland northern ireland has the lowest per pupil expenditure on education anywhere in the uk anywhere in england wales scotland uh, uh we're below all of that we're 108 million pounds a year less well off when it comes to education spending than england which is the lowest apart from us and 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 that's a legacy obviously but this is truly cruel what is happening and what is being proposed and we cannot as a council our council is probably more exposed than any other because of our rurality and everything else that goes with that so i i think we need to make the most strong possible representations on this issue in defense of our children in defense of education workers as well thank you chair okay thanks uh councillor coffee i'm assuming that uh, your colleague councillor emmett mcallear is happy to include that in his initial proposal chair could i just very briefly come back into that um I'm happy to support absolutely everything Councillor Coffey says, but I think maybe it warrants a second letter. And if he's happy to propose, I'm happy to second because I think the Secretary of State should be included in that particular correspondence as well. Because I'm aware that during the course of that actions, he actually warned the Department of Education that they needed to make significant cuts to what was termed the current spending trajectory. So I think it's maybe we risk conflating maybe the two issues there. So I'm happy to second his proposal that we do a se separate letter to both the uh, the permanent secretary and the secretary of state on that particular matter, Chair. Okay, that's grand. Uh, Thanks, Chair. Happy with that. Thank you. All right, you're happy enough with that then. Okay, so that's two proposals we have on the table, and both have been seconded. We have uh, we have Councillor Stephen Donnelly in the chamber coming in. Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, whilst, of course, I'm um, naturally sympathetic with uh, Councillor O'Coffey's re remarks, I feel that just given it touches on the work of the mm -hmm. Education Authority Board, I, I'll just probably should be safe uh, declaring interest once more. Okay, you're declaring interest. Okay, thank you. Uh, now you're on to the Chamber again, and with Councillor Bernie McIlduff. Thank you, Chair. Chair, um, the take up of free school meals is not 100%. You know, in, in terms of entitlement, those who are entitled, there's uh, not a hundred percent take up. So I think in any correspondence to the education authorities, should that be Department of Education and or Education Authority, we should be asking for an assurance that they are working hard, that they have a strategy and an action plan for one hundred percent take up of free school meals in terms of those who are entitled. Now it has been said to me by some people that in an ideal world. For example, uh, the Social Security Agency um, or other bodies, you know, uh, Universal Credit, Working Families Tax Credit, the, those authorities would be working hand in glove with the education authorities to ensure 100% take up. But there may be GDPR, you know, um, hurdles or barriers in the way of that happening. But really the question is, what is the department doing? And what is the Education Authority doing to ensure 100% take up? Because it's way below that figure at this time. Thank you, Chair. I'm assuming that Councillor McAdoff uh, maybe uh, 
the proposer and seconder of the of the two proposals can incorporate yep. what you're saying yep. into their proposals. Yes, indeed. I'll assume of that at the stage. Uh, going now to Webex, and we have first of all, Councillor Dr. Josephine Dehan. Thank you, Chair. Well, Chair, I am a very strong believer in universal free meals, especially for primary school children. Uh, members will be aware uh, of the um, negative impact uh, that being hungry has on a child's attention and concentration and the fact that the child is provided with a nutritious uh, meal in the middle of the day I think is vital to ensure learning. So uh, I think that it's definitely worth investing uh, in our young children and in their future and society will eventually benefit from that. In relation to Councillor Michael Duff's proposal, I support that. We did have debate last year in the Chamber about barriers to families applying for free school meals uh, online and the fact that many families lost out uh, in previous years because of that. So currently I would support uh, uh, any measure that would be designed to ensure that any family that's eligible for free school meals uh, should should really uh, uh, be, uh, have the opportunity to uh, uptake that opportunity. But by and large, I think universal school free school meals for primary school children is something that we should aspire to. I really am dismayed by the announcement regarding the uh, the the amount of money that schools are required to save in this financial year. I think it's impossible, Chair. Many of us will sit on boards of governors um, in schools and we know how stretched school budgets are currently. Uh, so, you know, this is really an impossible ask. And I think really um, reflecting back to the discussion we had last night on the delay in the Struhl Shared Education Campus, you know, the cynic in me would maybe suggest that this could be a cost cutting measure, putting this important project on the long finger. Um, but, you know, I think it's a false economy. So I want to speak in support uh, of the proposals that have been brought forward uh, by members this evening. This is an important topic. The education of our children should be uh, foremost in our priorities because after all, Chair, they are our future. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dr. Dehan. And uh, I'll just confirm with our proposers and seconders, that's Councillor McAleer and Councillor Coffey, that they're happy enough with uh, the comments of Councillor Michael Duff to be incorporated into their proposals. Happy enough for that, Chair, yeah. Happy here, Chair. Thank you. Moving on now to Councillor Robert Irvine via WebEx. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I would echo a lot of the sentiments of the previous speakers in regard to the issues confronting our children and schools and the pressures being put under EA. However, no matter what happens, I think the, the, the whole of the budget for Northern Ireland PLC is under pressure. It's not only is education under pressure, I know health is under pressure because of the two authorities that I sit on. And the money just isn't there, and that's the unfortunate thing. So the, the reality is there is no additionality or will not be unless additional revenue sources are levied and brought in. Um, we may have to wonder what's going to happen to the regional rate going forward when we strike a rate next month. Um, we might have a few surprises there, but there's no money in the system. And the issue of looking for additionality and crying is, is not going to get that. I think we've got to see what we can do to actually work within the, the pocket that we have. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Irving. OK, uh, there are no other speakers. You've, you've all heard the proposers, the proposals, and the seconders, the, uh, the various issues that have been raised there by Councillor McAleer, seconded by Councillor Coffey, and then Councillor Coffey, seconded by Councillor McAleer. Incorporating the comments of uh, Councillor McAdoff and Councillor Dehan and Councillor Robert Irvine. Are we all agreed? Okay, I don't see any dissent. Thank you. Okay, back to matters arising and 
That was page two, page three. Should be executive. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just midway down page three, um, under item four three, just to draw members' attentions to the uh, attention to the response from the Department for the Economy, and this was regarding financial support for businesses, uh, really the cost of doing business crisis. And it's indicated by the Permanent Secretary there's no specific provision obviously being made available by that department, but makes uh, or refers us onwards to Bayes, which is the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. Okay, uh, can we have a proposal and seconder in a note, please? Professor Barry McAdoff in the Chamber. Yeah, proposed to note, and I'll come back with the comments. Okay, proposed to note. Have you a second to note? Councillor Alan Rainey, MBE, in the Chamber. I think we're all agreed with the noting. Uh, Councillor McAdoff. Okay, I suppose the obvious question from this is, um, can a local business who is struggling at this time to heat their premises access government funding support? So if we go to our own council business support, you know, they might say that... Uh, mentoring through the council and through our enterprise companies is available and there might be some capital equipment money coming down the track but at this time there is no knowledge of any scheme where businesses can so so can that be interpreted that letter is it saying that there is available help at this time for businesses who are struggling to heat their premises Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'll no. bring the chief executive. No, well, it's it's really just to. I'm not sure. It might have been rhetorical on Councillor McAdoff's part, but I think the only thing that this letter is telling us is about a discount that's being applied more generally, but that there will be no centralised relief funds available to which councils or sorry uh, businesses can apply. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Back to. Our minutes again for matters of raising, page three, page four, Chief Executive. Chair, really just a brief response from the EA, uh, received 22nd of, or dated rather 22nd of December, and this is essentially just noting the Council's further representations in relation to St Mary's Primary School, Five Mile Town. Okay, we, can we have a proposal and second to note, please? Uh, so Paul Robinson showing that he's prepared to note. Have a second for noting. Councillor Rosemary Barton in the chamber. Okay, and on to speakers here. We have Councillor Emmett McAleer, BioWebEx. Thank you, Chair. No, I think this is the, the CCMS as opposed to the EA response, but CCMS, yeah. But yeah, just, again, you know, we've been waiting on this response uh for a wee a bit of time now, but the response is, is absolutely Horrible again, uh, completely dismissive of what we've requested, and this this prevailing attitude that seems to persist in some of these bodies, whenever contacted by council, that they will do, you know, the bare minimum and pay lip service to to what has actually been requested. So, uh, I did have my hand up there that I would have noted the the response, but it's again, it's another response that's it's plainly just not good enough, um. So I would just like to to really put that on record, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, it's been proposed and seconded to note. Uh, I think we're all agreed on that uh, with your comments, Councillor McAleer. Thank you. Okay, we're now on to we're on page four, page five, page six, page six, Chief Executive. Thank you, Chair. Just again, about a third of the way down the page, just uh, this was the Council's concerns regarding the lack of timely responses from DFI, in particular those matters raised at DEA meetings. So a response from the Permanent Secretary um, indicating their uh, preferred contact arrangements, first of all, members, I suppose by way of email, and their efforts that they do uh, endeavour to respond in a timely fashion uh, to Council queries. Uh, but sometimes, obviously, there would be other work pressures as well. Okay, thanks, Chief Executive. Uh, can we have a proposal and seconder to note? Councillor Matthew Bell in the Chamber. Councillor Michael Duff. Uh, are you seconding to note as well? Yeah. Happy to second the note. Yes, indeed. Okay. Uh, just briefly, you know, 
We look forward to the engagement in February with DFA Roads. Uh, there doesn't appear to be a commitment till DEA meetings. Or is there? There is a commitment to DEA yeah, continue using them? Yeah, certainly, there were, I think the invitations were formally issued today to members, right. so certainly there is, Chair. From memory, I think they're either the 3rd, 3rd and the 6th of Good. February, so and we'll feed into that link. Yeah. Just one, one point, you know, uh, I want to try and catch them doing something right now. Of course, right now, you know, people are very anxious about gritting and all of that, and there is a criteria that we don't think is rural friendly enough, of course, but just to record my appreciation, tell the local section office for going the extra for a week in Oma this very week, you know, in respect of a week where they do make every effort, you know, even if it doesn't meet the normal criteria. And this very week, I have a, an example of that where I asked them to intervene to make things easier for the bereaved family. And they did do that. So I just want to record my appreciation and maybe convey that to DFA Roads. Thank you, Chair. OK, thanks, Councillor McAdoo. Thank you. Okay, we're all agreed there. Was uh, page six, uh, page seven, page eight, page nine, page ten, page eleven, page twelve, page thirteen, Chief Executive. Yes, Chair, just uh, mid, well, towards the bottom of page 13, uh, there was some discussion at the last committee meeting as to whether or not the Council had agreed a position in relation to a visit to Tara Mines and had undertaken to investigate that. So the situation is, Chair, that at the October 2021 Council meeting, uh, when we were dealing with a, a related motion, a member proposed uh, that a visit be arranged and that was duly seconded. However, the Chair ruled correctly that the only matters under consideration were the motion itself or any other amendments. Uh, the proposal then for a visit was never re-put to the Council at any stage, so we don't have any proposal that we would undertake a visit to Tara Mines. Okay, I don't think we need a proposal. No. So. Okay, that's a verbal update from the Chief Executive. Thank you. Uh, So, page 14. 14, Chief Executive. Yeah, well, I may be picking page 16 up there, Chair. So okay, the same. and page 15, uh, page 16, Chief Executive. Okay, Chair. So, just um, a couple of letters here for, for members' consideration, both from the Department of Health Permanent Secretary. So, the first relates to the Council's concerns specifically regarding the crisis in primary health care and the need for an essential. Um, immediate financial support to be injected um, and the, the the response sets out a, the, the various financial supports uh, that have been put in place through the through the department and also refers to the uh, wider confederation approach that has been undertaken in, in the area. They've also provided an update in this letter then chair regarding the business case for the new health and care centre in Lisnesky. Um, the second letter, Chair, was on some very specific matters relating to the contract arrangements for the new health centre in Lisnesky, but I'll maybe just comment on it here as members may, may reference both. Um, we had sought clarification of the difference between the GP, sorry, GMS and APMS uh, contract models, so they're detailed. We had also asked that the department would exclude consideration of an APMS model as part of their considerations and the Permanent Secretary has advised that any and all uh, options that are received will be assessed in accordance with the criteria. And I suppose the only other point I would highlight, Chair, um, our final request in that letter, uh, which is also included in the resolutions, is that we would receive an early update on the outcome of the interviews, which we were advised would take place on the 22nd of December. So it's just to note, as of today, we have received no update on that process. Okay, Chief Executive, thank you. Uh, first of all, can we have a proposal and second to, to note? Uh, and I'll go to Councillor Coffey via WebEx. Yeah, I'm happy to propose to note, Chair. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, in regard to the second, uh, both uh, obviously note both pieces of correspondence. The, the first one illustrates a very laissez-faire approach to uh, supporting 
vital primary care, primary care, like uh, we just heard education services are underfunded in Northern Ireland compared to any other part of the UK. Similarly with uh, primary care, uh, GPs underfunded here. Uh, and obviously the impact of that is gonna be felt greatest in rural areas where there are rural issues, which are simply not uh, uh, catered for within the funding envelope that exists. And even the measures like we're now told that we are uh, first on the list whenever that happens for uh, you know uh, support for SMTs uh, is is too little too late. We're already losing our GP services. Um, now, in terms of the second uh, correspondence, uh, this is very interesting, and I didn't understand fully how these things are uh, set out. So it, I'm, I'm very glad we did ask for this information because it is clear that. Um, you know, there is a mechanism here effectively for outsourcing of GP services beyond uh, what is uh, uh, directly provided by a GP themselves. So a third party can come along and then subsequently contract in GPs to provide a service. Obviously, to me, that uh, speaks of uh, uh, an agenda around privatization. And it is quite something that there are two already in place, but both are actually being delivered by health service entities themselves so that they're using a mechanism which appears purpose built to actually facilitate privatization to actually uh, deliver services which have collapsed through uh, the public sector. So while that is good, it is also very concerning that we have a situation where this door is left open and there is no certainty that, uh, that uh, through that door will not come vested private sector interests. So, uh, this is genuinely concerning and it speaks a lot about the internal markets that have been created in our NHS to facilitate privatization processes over time. And unfortunately, Stormont has been quite uh, uh, involved in doing that over here as well as has happened in England under the Tories. So uh, this this correspondence is genuinely concerning. Uh, it, it, it points to the fact that G GP services are not being properly funded here. We're not seeing the investment we need in supporting our GPs, we're not we're having a result in worse crisis in GPs in Fermanagh and Tyrone anywhere in the UK as a result. And now the door has been left open to private sector companies to come in and and, and provide these services, which people are our first point of call for all of us. So not not in any way uh, should we draw any conclu uh, positive conclusions to this correspondence. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Coffey. And uh, next up via WebEx, we have Councillor Eamon Keenan. Are you first of all prepared to second the noting of the two pieces of correspondence, Councillor Keenan? Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'll second. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, as Donald says, there's not much to be uh, happy about this correspondence. The only good thing is that we have, well, not good, but we've got clarification at least on the difference between the GMS and APMS contracts and uh, the clarification that they will be considered both types. Uh, as I described last month from the information that I heard at the meeting with SPPG. Now, when I raised this last month, I was basically called a liar and I was accused of scaremongering by a member of this council. So it would now seem, it would now seem that my concerns and the community's concerns were not unfounded or false, and it was definitely not scaremongering. So either the member that accused me of scaremongering needs to apologise to myself, or else maybe he needs to pay more attention or he should have paid more attention uh, when we're having a very important meeting um, with SPPG. Um, so getting back to the situation with Maple, it, it seems that nothing really has improved much whilst we're waiting for the new contractor. So, uh, and we haven't received any information on the deadline as uh, the chief executive said is up. So I'd like to propose we write back to the Department of Health on SPPG to find out the process contract allocation is progressing and when will the new contract new contract are likely to be in operation thank you chair okay uh have we got a seconder for councillor keenan's proposal there and he seconded the noting have we got a seconder for his proposal happy to second chair okay councillor mcgallier and we have a few councillors come on via i think we're all agreed with that not seeing dissent, although there's a few speakers wanting to come on here. Uh, go to WebEx, and first of all, if you can lower your hand there, Councillor Keaton, please. Thank you. Councillor Victor Warrington and WebEx. Thank you, Chair. Well, I think there's nothing in this correspondence 
uh, that has come back that we didn't already know. It would certainly be good if we could move forward and know how the recruitment um, process went with uh, ma the Maple practice, uh, because uh, I'm sure all the Ernie councillors are in the same boat as myself. They are getting they are getting numerous um, numerous uh, sort of daily not daily but weekly complaints about the the practice uh, and difficulties that they have in, in getting uh, getting appointments etc. I suppose you know I know very strong comments from Councillor Coffey uh, on the the the, the privatisation thing, but you know uh, moving forward, I'm sure the patients um, in either listening to ski or in that surrounding area are, are not really going to be too worried where the 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 GPs are coming from, as long as they're on the ground. Uh, so that's all I have to say. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks, Councillor Warrington. Next up, we have Councillor Dr. Josephine Dehan, via Webex. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Alison, for your report. Uh, just if I could make a few comments on the Maple Healthcare Crisis, Chair, and um, I suppose I'm not really uh, surprised that we've not had any feedback regarding attempts to recruit. Uh, uh, a new contract holder for Maple Healthcare. I suppose really uh, what we have here is a reenactment of the crisis that afflicted Dromore and Trillic surgeries. And on that occasion, the Western Trust actually uh, became the contract holder. Um, now, and a lot of resources have gone into holding up the services in Dromore and Trillic. Uh, including um, the recruitment of locum GPs at very, very attractive uh, rates of remuneration, which really makes it very difficult for uh, ordinary practices to get in uh, additional uh, GP cover. I think I'm correct in recalling that the chief executive of the Western Trust uh, uh, reassured us uh, that, you know, uh, there would be no um, invitation for private GP companies to come over and be the alternative provider of medical services. But I think really um, what we are seeing here is the outworkings of decades of underinvestment in primary care. Members will be surprised to know that in terms of uh, uh, general practice nursing, that throughout the Southwest GP Federation area, we are grossly under provided for uh, by as much as 50%. And uh, efforts to uh, develop general practice nursing um, has not been funded uh, on a recurrent basis. And uh, I think that is a matter of huge concern because uh, as members will know, we do not yet have our multidisciplinary teams in place. And so the pressures on primary care are enormous and I have grave concerns over what will happen uh, in terms of Maple Health Care. So just to make those comments, Chair, and uh, I, I support the proposal to write back uh, to seek uh, further clarification on the situation and the proposals going forward to ensure that high standards of patient care are met. Thank you. OK, thanks, Councillor Dr. Dehan. Can you lower your hand, please, Councillor Warrington? Next, we go to Councillor Emmett McAleer, via Webex. Thank you, Chair. No, I'm, I'd say I'm happy enough to uh, to second Councillor Keenan's proposal there. I think this is it's probably embarrassing for some members, maybe reading or listening back to what was said in a previous discussion on this. Um, and and now that the facts are actually confirmed, as Councillor Keenan had feared the last day, um, it's it's really a worrying worrying development. I suppose the the query maybe that I would have, and and Councillor Keenan might be happy enough to to amend maybe his proposal to include it, is to to just outright ask the question: How is this plan to be fun, financed or funded? The the new health centre going forward, we've seen even earlier in this meeting where we're talking about. Over a hundred million planned cuts in a hundred million pounds worth of planned cuts in education. We have the threats to our own and and the threats which are being enacted against the SWA and Anna Skillen. 
when they're cutting everything left, right and centre, how are they then able to afford to pay and fund private privatisation of these services? So that's something really that we need to be very vocal on going forward. And uh, as, I'm, as I say, I'm happy enough to support Councillor Keenan's proposal, but I think we need to maybe just get a wee bit more clarification. That's hopefully will be amenable to, to allow in that uh, progress as well. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Uh, thanks, Councillor McAleer, for that. Uh, you've seconded it. And I'm sure uh, Councillor Keenan's happy enough to incorporate what you've just said there and seek uh, clarification also on the how it's going to be financed and funded. Yeah, so, happy enough for that. Yeah, I suppose that, the, wor the, worry, the worry is that it's going to be a PFA or something similar like the SWA where we overpay for it. But yeah, thank you. Okay. Next up, we have uh, Councillor Seamus Green via WebEx. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I see a, a, a few people has been uh, trying to make politics again out of this issue. I just think it's an absolute disgrace. It's a place uh, for politics. Right. Sorry, is 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 Councillor Green? Has, uh, has hold, on, hold on a second, Councillor Green. I'm not going to tolerate anyone coming on over the top of the chair or any other member this evening. I make that quite clear. You will be cut out of the meeting. So just Thank be aware you. of that, Councillor Green. Carry on. Thank you, Chair. Uh, it seems to have become a habit this year from uh, one or two councillors. Um, uh, uh, so uh, the, the mistruths and the half truths that be uh, told and things like this. Uh, the at the last meeting, uh, there was suggestions that uh, counts or uh, patients were going to have to pay for their GP. That que question was asked and categorically answered at the meetings uh, that that wasn't going to be the case. Uh, uh, people were still going to be able to access the GP services for free. Uh, I then uh, seen then uh, after the last meeting was over that a certain councillor who spoke there uh, a couple of uh, times ago there that uh, I hadn't supported the latter and he put it up on social media, which was uh, a complete lie. You were so, the only uh, one that opposed it while speaking, Seamus. You might have changed your mind because somebody in your party told you, but that's not my problem. Sorry, Councillor Keenan. Don't have to be warned again, please. Councillor Green. Thank, thanks, Chair. You see, that's the type of bad mannered, uh, uh, ill uh, informed people that we have in the council. And that's the type of people that's going out and scaremongering scare, scare around. Uh, uh, vulnerable people uh, in the Air and East area, and I just think it's an absolute disgrace. Uh, this uh, and by the way, the Maple Healthcare uh, uh, Maple Healthcare Group is a private uh, practice at the minute. Uh, some uh, a councillor there talked about it that it was a, a public practice. It is not. This is owned. It is a, a partnership of GPs. Privately owned, uh, but the GP services is provided free uh, at entry, and that's the way we were told in that meeting that it was going to continue to uh, uh, happen. So, if the councillors want to tell these half truths to go out and and scare uh, vulnerable people, sick people, disabled people. That they're going to have to pay for their GP services. I'm not going to listen to them. I'm going to call them out on it. And I, I have no doubt they'll come out again on social media tonight and try to uh, 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 tell half truths again what was said. But GP services are not going to be charged for in the air and east area. That is the fact of what. Which council? Which councillor? Which councillor said that? Seamus, no councillor said right. the GPs were charged. Yeah, Councillor Keenan. There's lies, there's lies going on here. These are challenges. Sorry, Councillor Keenan. It's accusations. your fourth time you've interrupted. I am now looking for a proposal. He's taking accusations against me. He's the one telling lies and he's trying to cover for himself. Your this proposal is lies. I'm not standing for it. No, it's lies. Chair, are you going to let that off? I'm looking for a proposal in second and probably be silenced. I'll propose Councillor Irvine so here. Irvine I'll proposes propose. that Councillor Keenan is silenced. I'll be a seconder. I will second that, Chair. Chair, I'm opposing that and I want a recorded vote. 
recorded that's, that's censorship to cover up Seamus Green's lies. It's been proposed and seconded. Needs a recorded vote, Chair, and a 25.3, Chair. You, you'll be muted as well, okay? Chair, this is poor chairmanship that you're this allowing for Green to make these not accusations. Fair. You were warned off. off. You were warned before the... Standing the order 25.4. Standing a point of order, Chair. I no. would challenge no, Seamus no, Point of order, Chair. You, you must hear my point of order on the standing no, order. accusations. Point of order, Chair. Is this Chair. a democracy? Or a... Order, point of order, Chair. Are you refusing Sen to hear my point of order, Chair? Mike. You're going to refuse to hear point of order. Is that right? Shell. Chair, is this a democracy or a dictatorship? Point of order, 25.3, Chair. Chair, you're obliged to hear a point of order. Okay, I'm bringing the Chief Executive in to clarify the situation. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Chair. Chair Don't some... shout the over the Chief Executive. So, Chair, sort of speaking, five, Chair, uh, standing order 25.3, has been fully complied with. Um, what the it states, and just to read for the, the record, if at a, me at a meeting any member of the council misconducts himself herself by persistently disregarding the ruling of the chair or by, he by behaving irregularly, improperly or offensively or by willfully obstructing the business of the council, the chairperson or any other member may move that the member named be not further heard. This, if seconded, shall be put and determined without discussion. It's been put and determined. It has not been put I to the council. Thank you, Chief Executive. It has Where's not been put to the council. It's been railroaded through. It has to be determined, like any other determination that requires you a vote. To facilitate the rules. Lies and accusations from Councillor Green. Chair, this is quite farcical. Is this going to be a dictatorship where I, I'm moving on? on where two people can put out another member? Is that it? When they take a whim. Chair, I propose that Councillor Green... You're, you're not coming in. Councillor McAleer, you will be silenced. This has to be we'll determined. It's like we determine a planning right, application or anything else that requires a vote. Councillor Keenan, Councillor McAleer, and Councillor Coffey. What? Chair, uh, Councillor Irvine here. I'm going to start... To to Hold, hold on, Chris Irvine. If we're going to start having the lock at meetings again, we will. If this is continuing. Well, that's democracy. If, if this continues, it will be done. That's on you if you want to do that. But we need clarification on this. This is a stand order that it's been again, provided by the Chief Executive, who is my advising officer. Can I, can I call for a, a legal opinion, please, Chair? No. Well, he can, Chair. It's if you want to hear it or not. It's my, it's my decision. End off. Can you go off? Yeah, Chair, you can't take the decision to silence elected members. That's that's not democracy. It's just a, it's a free non What is it, you know? Okay. Okay. Stay muted. No. Yeah, that's all right. Okay. Okay. Uh, we uh, the situation's been clarified. Can we have a proposer now and a seconder? That Councillor McAleer, Councillor O'Coffey, and Councillor Keenan be silenced. Okay, Councillor. Robert Irvine's proposing. Councillor Roy Crawford seconding. Okay, thank you. Councillor Green will allow you back in again. Councillor Green has put his hand down. That's okay. You can lower your hand, Councillor McAleer, if you can hear me. Okay, uh, those other issues were agreed, I take it, to, before we were interrupted. And that was proposed by Councillor Keenan and seconded by Councillor McAleer to, regarding the financing and the clarification issue and that. We all agreed. 
not seeing any dissent on that. Okay. Okay, uh, back into the minutes again, and we're still matters are easy, and it's page 17. Okay, so matters are easy. Councillor Warrington. Councillor Warrington. Yeah, we'll, we'll settle it. Okay, uh, for the members who are left, uh, we are now rectifying the, the mics uh, and Adams carrying out that task. Just uh, leave it a patience here, folks. Okay. All right, folks. Uh, we're now on to reports for decision and item five. Chief Executive's uh, direct report is 5.1 and is to receive a verbal update on recommendations from the Rural Affairs Subcommittee meeting held on the 12th of January 2023. Chief Executive. Thank you, Chair. Just obviously the main uh, minutes from the meeting will be at next month's committee meeting, but uh, they've, there were a series of papers, five papers in total were considered. Uh, the various recommendations set out in the reports were ex a approved by the committee subcommittee uh, and the, then there was an additional recommendation chair that the the council would undertake research identifying examples across the district where schools are sharing and providing community access to facilities so we'll obviously get that progressed and scoped so with the subject of that additional recommendation the approval of the various reports chair just that members would note that update i would advise as well the meeting was chaired by councillor warrington in councillor rainey's absence so he may wish to to formally propose. Okay, uh, Councillor Warrington, you've heard the Chief Executive, you prepared to propose uh, adoption of what you said. Councillor okay, Warrington? Can't hear me, Chair, no. Yeah, Just hear you now. Yeah, are you prepared to Propose. Okay, thank you. And we have uh, Councillor Bernice Swift, BioWebEx. Councillor Swift. Yes, Gormaga here. Look, I can second that, and also I do sincerely wish to be recorded as disagreeing with that ruling before. And please, because I do not want it to be ever heard or understood that I ignored uh, such. Uh, a lack of freedom of speech to being allowed. And I understand that it did become quite controversial, but I will not sit idly by and think that it's okay for people to be silenced. And I don't like this locking system. And I would ask that that be reviewed immediately forthwith. Gurmagat. Well, just to clarify the position, Councillor Swift uh, have been very tolerant this evening and they were warned several times. And I, I'm not going to get into an argy bargy on it now. Uh, People have been warned, and I don't want to be locking systems. I want to feed the bit here, but if people are going to shout and disrespect each other, that's not going to be tolerated by me or anyone else. I would think in the chair. So thank yeah. you for your comments, and that's obviously, grand. thank you. So free the people now. Thank you, Councillor Roy Crawford, BioWebex. On down, okay. Okay, we're on now to item 5.2, and that is to consider a report on proposed revision of the planning committee protocol and scheme of delegation, and as paper A, Chief Executive. Yes, Chair, this is just to update the planning um, protocol. 
and the scheme of delegation to refer to the in introduction of a validation checklist. This is part of our overall planning improvement uh, project and is also one of the recommendations that came from the Northern Ireland Audit Office and the PAC reports and has been approved by the Planning Committee. So just recommending, Chair, that the Council approves the uh, updating accordingly and that authorises the onward submission to the Department for Infrastructure. Okay. We've heard the Chief Executive come in for proposal from Seconder for the adoption. Councillor Anne-Marie Donnelly, uh, I'm assuming it's proposing, seconded by Councillor Robert Irvine and supported by Councillor Robinson. All agreed? Thank you. Okay, on to item six, and it's the Corporate Services and Governance Directorate Reports, and it's item 6.1, and to consider the report on consultations, paper B, and we're now on to uh, Louise Horner, who will be joining by WebEx. Louise. Um, thank you. Can you can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. I don't think you can see me though. Why is that not happening? Not again. No, we, okay. we can hear you. That's oh, you can hear me. Okay. Um, That's fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you, Chair, and, and good evening, members. Um, so at item six point one. There is a report on the council's work in respect of consultations. <clears throat> so there are there are two responses presented for decision, and a number of items for information. So I'll deal with the first of the two responses. So at two point one, um, there is a draft response on the consultation on support for care leavers. So the Department of Health is currently seeking views on the proposed amendments to various regulations in relation to care, care leavers. Um, the draft council response is generally supportive of the aims and proposals. However, we have raised a number of concerns specifically relating to, firstly, the assessment of needs, in particular, the nature of trauma. So this in particular, this relates to care leavers who've come from um, the background of, of uh, human tra of trafficking. Um, and secondly, the um, provision of suitable and safe accommodation to allow the individual tra to transition to independent living. And further, we think that the further definition of support is needed in the list of matters that um, trusts need to take into account. So at 9.1, it's recommended that the council approves the draft response. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that, Louise. And uh, go to the Chamber, first of all, Councillor Stephen Donnelly. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, I'm, ha I'm more than happy to propose the, the response. I think that uh, what, what we have here is uh, fairly uh, sensible, and indeed, just going through this, I mean, I think that, uh, I mean, I, I certainly welcome um, the emphasis and indeed the, the attention that this does give to the issue uh, of those uh, of an asylum background or indeed those who um, uh, have been human trafficked and uh, dealing with those particular uh, unique issues that uh, re relate to their uh, exiting the care system. And subsequent to that, I, I welcome the fact that this does um, focus on the, the question of transition and actually that broader question of making sure that the resources are there subsequently to be able to make sure that children are um, subsequently uh, transitioned into safe uh, uh, situations. Um, but on that um, subject, Chair, I mean, uh, I see that we do have a section here of our response, which is focusing on the question of making sure that every young person lives in suitable, affordable accommodation and is enabled to keep themselves safe. And I suppose just tangentially related to that, uh, I was uh, wondering if we are in a position at this stage, if the chief executive would be able to provide an update as to whether we have a meeting as of yet scheduled with the housing executive to discuss the ending homelessness together strategy. Okay, thanks. Sir. Thank you. Yes, chair. The twentieth of February. They, it's a it's a joint special council meeting between DFI and the housing executive and the homelessness strategy is on that agenda. Okay. Okay, thanks for that, Councillor Donnelly. So it's been proposed by Councillor Donnelly for the adoption of that piece. Mm -hmm. Seconder. Councillor Matthew Bell in the chamber. I think we're all agreed. Okay, Louise, if you want to carry on. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chair. So the second um, draft response is um, to the DFE's consultation on the Energy One Stop Shop. Um, so our draft response is, is broadly supportive of the Energy One Stop Shop implementation plan. 
So um, our response focuses on um, and concerns relating to the principles of the initiative, strategic objectives, the advisory information and support services offered, um, the need to prioritise vulnerable domestic consumers, but ensuring that the one-stop shop is for all consumers and businesses, and that services and support offered in each year of the pilot, including um, an indication of um, the council's willingness to participate in an initiative so that lessons from a rural area of Northern Ireland are incorporated early on. So it is recommended that the council approve the response appendix two. Thank you. Okay, thanks again, Louise. Okay, can we have a proposer and seconder for the adoption of part two? Councillor Dr. Josephine Dehan, BioWebEx. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair. And I want to thank uh, Louise and her team for bringing forward uh, these excellent consultation responses, uh, Chair. Um, I'm, I'm happy to uh, propose uh, the draft consultation response, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Dr. Dehan. And have we got a seconder, the adoption of that part? Okay, Councillor Paul Robinson, BioWebEx, seconding. And we're all agreed. Okay, Louise, thank you. Okay, thank you, Chair. So the third, the third part to this um, report is the is key issues for, for information. So, firstly, we have um, forthcoming consultations to which responses will be presented to a future committee meeting. This includes, obviously, the a consultation on the temporary suspension of emergency general surgery at the SWA. So, and um, secondly, a consultation on the draft autism strategy. So those will be presented to members in a future committee meetings. Um, a number of forthcoming consultations for information only. So there's a number of traffic calming schemes in the district. I'm not going to go through each of those, but members are welcome to respond to those as they wish. And there are also two consultations on level four and five and higher education and further education, HE and FE, and principles for vocational qualifications both from the Department of Economy. Um, so there are also forthcoming consultations which we've referred to other um, council colleagues for technical consideration. This includes the circular economy strategy, and um, which is about responsible production and consumption, and the draft ammonia strategy for, for Northern Ireland. Um, and finally, consultations submitted since the last a policy and resources committee include our response to the consultation on what slavery and human trafficking. So um, members are asked to um, uh, note those for information. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Louise. Can pr proposer and seconder to note the pieces that uh, Louise has covered. Okay, uh, go to WebEx and with Councillor Adam Gannon. Thank you, Chair. It's just on uh, three one there. The temporary suspension of emergency general surgery. Obviously, the consultation, the trust have put out some of the uh, locations for the consultation, which is welcome. Um, but just if we could perhaps write to the trust, the, the, the locations are kind of lacking. There's some, obviously, the Forum, Castle Park, Bonacre, all standard enough. Um, but we need to be looking at other places that are impacted. You know, Balik has a massive travel distance, Ross Lay, uh, Derrick Garrison, uh, we need to, uh, if we, I propose that we write to the trust to say that we are not uh, content or we're not happy with the venues that are being proposed and that we would like uh, more venues uh, to be considered in uh, areas such as Billick, Garrison, uh, Rossley, Newtown, Butler, um, and uh, Derek Lee and uh, many other places. I'm sure other councillors will come in and give a few more suggestions there to add to that list, Chair, I'll not go on all night. And as well, also, uh, could we express concern um, that we're going to, that they're going to a number of areas um, such as, as such as Gorton and things like that, that it's very, I know obviously Tyrone is serviced by the hospital, but you know, when you're in the winter in Oma, you're kind of, your, the travel distance is going to be an impact and it is for mana that is going to be hardest impacted by this and if, if they start to to move into other areas it could skew the where the impact is but anyway if we could express those in a letter chair and sorry I, I rambled on a bit there but that's my proposal thank you okay first of all 
to cover Louise's piece there, you're proposing that we note the, the pieces that Louise has just covered. You're yes, happy to propose that first as well. Can, can we have a second for that noting? Councillor Swift, are you prepared to second that noting? Yes, certainly, and I'll come back in then, Gormagat. Okay, I'm proposing second a note, and I think we're all agreed with that. Uh, I'm going to bring the chief executive maybe and to clarify the situation first. Yeah. Chair, maybe just two two suggestions, and perhaps just um, um, a comment in relation to Councillor Gannon's proposal that he may just wish to take on board. It might be appropriate, Chair, at this juncture, just to bring in the relevant correspondence, if members are are um, comfortable with that, which is in your other folder, and it's item um, nine point one two. Um, I think, Chair, in terms of if we were going back to the trust, and while I I note uh, Councillor Gannon's comments in relation to the the OMA. Uh, side of the district in terms of the DEA representation, I, I wouldn't be inclined to say it may be a lesser impact. I certainly wouldn't say it would have no impact because remember, the Southwest Acute Hospital is meant to be for, for not just this district but the wider sub region. They, I think they trust have obviously sought to mirror the DEA approach in terms of their consultation and engagement. And I know Councillor Gannon mentioned just maybe around the choice of venues. Would it be maybe fairer to say that we wouldn't be satisfied with the extent of the programme of venues and the geographic, the spread of geographic locations? So that I think we'd encourage them while retaining those seven events that they would certainly need to go much broader in terms of Fermanagh in particular. And we could name a, a number of the, the, the settlements that, that have already been referenced. I'm sure other members will do so too. I would just be concerned, Chair, if we... Um, suggest we're dissatisfied with these venues, we may actually end up losing um, opportunities for engagement on this side of the district as well. So it's, ju it's just a suggestion. I suppose the other point to say, Chair, for maybe for completeness, and Louise has obviously referenced it in her report, we now see the, the format of this consultation, which was very much flagged by the Trust at their special council meeting with us. Um, but it is unusual in that it is seeking the, the respondents to come forth with proposals as to how the services may be reinstated and retained on a sustainable basis. And we, we will obviously uh, work to, to provide and detail a response that meets those requirements. But it is just to highlight it's a it's perhaps not a usual approach to consultation. So if Councillor Gannon was was content maybe with that chair, I, I would I would certainly keep these seven, but seek that we get more and the breadth of locations, particularly across rural Fermanagh. Mr. Gallant, are you happy enough with what you've heard from the Chief Executive? Yes, Chair, and maybe if we can incorporate some of those points around the unusualness of coming forward with solutions as well, or, uh, or maybe we'll have that at another point, but whatever uh, Chief Executive feels appropriate in this letter or in a future one. Okay, uh, you're happy to propose that. That's, thank you for that. And Councillor Swift, you're happy to second that. And I know you want to make a couple of comments here. Yeah, just very briefly, yes, happy to second. Um, and I would be very strongly advocating to most definitely retain uh, the already uh, assigned areas where the consultations are going to take place. But yes, I was very disappointed to read what much more uh, needs to be facilitated in the various locations, especially as I am a rural Earn West representative and know only too well the distances and the issues. For example, the one area that has been listed for the Erin West DEA located in Belcoo, great facility and everything else, but we must bear in mind places as remote as Derrigan, Lake Timor, all the other ends. Balik was already mentioned. Uh, I feel more needs to be included and it's not too late to do that. So please, in this instance, we speak out loudly and clearly to WHSCT and ask them to consider that very uh, as an imperative going forward. And I'm not satisfied with the ticket only off-putting approach either. That actually lends to only exclude what would be great attendance for people to be informed and certainly most definitely give their voice to the consultation. So that's it in a nutshell. Gurramagat. Okay, thanks, Councillor Swift. And you're second at that. So uh, we'll bring Councillor Paul Blake in now for a comment from WebEx. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thanks for letting me in. I think it's kind of indicative of uh, of how the whole thing has been handled up to now, but very much supportive of what my council colleague, Councillor Gannon and Councillor Swift have said regarding 
um, and follow on from the chief executive, an extension of the number of venues that you need to widen the scope for this consultation. If they want to listen to the voices of all the people that will be impacted by the loss of the service, temporary or otherwise, then you need to widen the scope for that. So the trust needs to open this up to the most remote parts of Fermanagh where people will be widely impacted. We've already seen the headline in today's Fermanagh Herald. Those are the people that need to be heard and throughout this consultation. So we need to be widening the scope. So I request that the trust during their 12 week exercise will listen to everyone and following from what Councillor Swift said, I also disagree with the ticket only event. It allows them to control the numbers and control everything about it. And and, and for me, I, I'm totally opposed to that. We want to have public meetings where we bring vast numbers of people together so that they can outline their feelings and the depth of feeling that they have towards the loss of their service and what it'll mean to them. So that is that is just to, to follow on from that. Uh, I think that's about it, is it? Yeah, seems to be. Okay, thanks for your comments, uh, Councillor Blake. And it's been obviously proposed by Councillor Gannon and seconded by Councillor Swift. Are we all agreed? Yeah, and if you can lower your hand. Thank you. Thanks for that. You're happy enough there with Louise with uh, 6.1, Louise, yeah? Yeah. Yes, thank you, Chair. Okay, on to item 6.2 now, and it's to consider the report on driving at work policy and guidance, and it's paper C, and it's again, it's over to Louise Horner. Louise. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, so, um, yes, the purpose of the report is to provide members with an update on the revised policy and guidance documents and documents associated with driving at work for business use and for fleet vehicles. So, um, uh, uh, a number of documents here. So, a driving at work, updated driving at work policy, Appendix 1, updated safe driving at work for business use guidance, and Appendix 2, updated safe driving at work using fleet vehicles guidance, Appendix 3, and the quality screening matrix and rural needs impact assessment, uh, Appendices 4 and 5. So, um, all documents were previously approved in November 2020. Only minor revisions have been made to the driving at work, driving for, at work policies, pages for that typo there, and both sets of guidance. So um, all three trade unions were consulted on the revisions to these documents and the recommendations have been incorporated and they were consulted um, the week between the 3rd and 17th of October. Um, so a key issue for decision is, so I'll take the driving at work policy first. So it now includes reference to climate change and sustainable development strategy, um, links to the highway code, um, change in um, designated officers, um, pro prohibition of um, smoking and vaping and taking illegal drugs, and um, further information prohibiting the use of handheld phones whilst driving. Um, secondly, at 2.2, so there is then the updated safe driving at work for business use guidance. So this guidance, now includes an update on the current backlog of MOT tests and certification, reporting all accidents and near misses through the Concerto Health and Safety Accident Reporting System and appendices on weather conditions and seasonal hazards and driving at work risk assessment for business use. And at 2.3, there is the updated safe driving at work using fleet vehicles guidance. So this includes all the um, points included in 2.2 uh, plus um, reporting on speeding and idling for council vehicles and the associated dis disciplinary procedure for speeding um, for speeding offences. So at 8.1, members are asked to approve the policy and associated guidance documents. Thank you. Thank you again, Louise, for 6.2. Uh, now we go to WebEx. And first up, we have Mr. Bernice Swift. Yes, I just wish to thank Louise for all her detailed report. Um, it's wonderful just to read it so clearly and have it explained so explicitly. And I am content to propose all of the recommendations and approve those. Kermagat. Thank you, Councillor Swift. Have we got a seconder? A seconder for the adoption. Okay, we have several coming up here now. <laughs> Councillor Anne-Marie Donnelly. You're happy enough to second? Happy to second, Chair. 
Okay, thanks again, Councillor Donnell. And all agreed. Thank you for that. Okay, and now we're on to item 6.3, and it's to consider the report on fair trade signage proposal, and it's paper D, and again, it's over to Louise. Louise. Okay, thank you, Chair. So this is the um, uh, proposal. This is what well, the purpose of this report, so is to provide information on a proposal that the council received to erect fair trade signage to um, recognise the district's achievement, achieving um, fair trade uh, community status. So the district first attained fair trade status in April 2020, and in August 2022, the district was successful in retaining the status. Um, so uh, at 1.4, Dr Christopher Stange, the Consulate General for St Vincent and the Grenadines and Secretariat to the All-Party uh, Parliamentary Group on Fair Trade in Northern Ireland um, contacted the Council in 2021 to request that the Council consider erecting fair trade signage to mark this achievement. So the key is issues for decision is um, regarding the cost of the fair trade nameplates and the existing boundary signs, which we have estimated to amount to about uh, just under £4,000, £3,695. Um, and I think I just wish to highlight um, the following issues by way of background before um, I come to the recommendation. So this issue of erecting fair trade signage has been discussed at the Fair Trade Fermanagh and OMA Fair Trade Steering Group. Um, in, 2020, in February 2022, it was recommended that signage should not be erected as it may lead to requests for other accreditations to also be recognised in a similar manner. Secondly, at 3.1.2, fair trade signage was then added to the agenda of the October 2022 steering group for further discussion. At that meeting, it was decided, given the current financial climate, that it would not be appropriate at this time to spend council funds on signage, but the matter could be reconsidered again later in, in the next financial year. So it was agreed that a report should come to this um, policy and resources committee. Um, at 3.1.3, um, and we saw, sought advice from the Fair Trade Foundation, who advised that they are no, no longer actively encouraging the erection of fair, tra of fair trade signage and that signage is not a requirement to retain fair trade status. At 3.1.4, seven councils in Northern Ireland have erected or about to put up some form of fair trade signage, either in the main towns or on their boundary signs. Uh, signs. However, at 3.1.5, um, new gateway signage for Enniskillen and Oma, which was approved um, in June 2021 at the Regeneration and Community Committee, um, that it was agreed and also agreed through wider stakeholder consultation that no other branding would be placed on these signs. So these are the gateway signs, therefore placing trade Fair trade nameplates on gateway signage in Enniskillen and Oma is not an option. So the alternative would be to attach fair trade nameplates to the existing 32 boundary signs, and that was what the figure of just under £4,000 referred to. So um, the recommendation is that the council approves the decision to proceed with the recommendation of the Fermanagh and Oma Fair Trade Steering Group to continue with the promotion of fair trade by a medium such as social media messaging and press releases with a view to reconsidering signage later in the year when the current if when the current financial situation may have improved thank you okay thank you louise for 6.3 now over to webex um, we have councillor bernice swift councillor swift Gurmagat, uh, and thank Louise again. And I think all of this um, discussion has concluded very satisfactorily. And it is great that Fermanagh and Oma Fair Trade Steering Group are in agreement with everything, all things considered. So I certainly will uh, approve the decision to proceed at the recommendation. Gurmagat. Okay, thanks, Councillor Swift. Have you got a seconder? Councillor Paul Robinson, BioWebEx. And all agreed. Okay. Thank you. 
Draw now to item 6.4 and is to consider the report on Digital Services Strategic Framework 2021-2026 update, paper E. And it's over to Louise. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, so this paper includes items for approval um, and uh, for noting. So um, firstly, so this background, this paper provides information on the FODC's digital strategic framework, which is attached, which hasn't changed. However, um, what has been updated are the ICT policies and procedures, firstly for employee employees, um, and this reflects changes you know, in technology, which will affect everybody, and ICT, and secondly, ICT policies and procedures for councillors. Um, and then there is an update on, um, on the digital strategic framework and associated uh, equality screening and rural needs assessment. So, um, starting with the ICT policy and procedure for employees, the key updates are around device refresh, bringing your own device and using it for work, instant messaging, free to use platforms such as WhatsApp, and the use of virtual meeting platforms and homeworking. And at 2.2, the ICT policies and procedures for elected members. So, the key update here is around device refresh so devices for elected members will be replaced when they reach six years of age um, so uh, rather than devices being replaced every four years and this is um, also to uh, demonstrate um, value for money um, also I'd like to draw members attention that the there's also included in this policy and procedure um, what's called a non-intrusive search of email accounts which sounds a bit worrying, but um, essentially it helps us to meet our needs for freedom of information requests and requests from um, enforcement agencies, for example, um, if uh, we need to um, provide information on missing person. So um, that's also included in the updated policy and procedure for elected members. So the recommendation is that the council approves the updated ICT policies and procedures for employees and for elected members. Thank you. Okay, thank you again, Louise, for that. Uh, can we have a proposal and seconder for the adoption of the report? Councillor Billy Swift proposing and Councillor Warrington seconding, I believe it was. Okay, all agreed. Thank you. Swift. So, okay, uh, that's that's agreed, uh, Louise. And that's that's you finished. Uh, oh, not uh, sorry, apologies, chair. Not quite. So there was one just key issue for information, which requires okay, go ahead, go ahead. apologies. Sorry, I've had quite a lot to get through. So this was um, just a very short update on the um, on the digital strategic framework. So uh, just to remind um, members that the uh, total spend for the um, Strategy is 1.8 million over five years, and to date, um, spend has been 52,000, with a remainder of 198,000. And this has uh, been spent on a number of measures: uh, cybersecurity, backup strategy, device refresh, full fibre network, telephony, and public Wi-Fi at 16 sites. So. Um, Members are asked to note the update on the progress on the digital strategic framework. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that, Louise. Can we have a proposal and seconder for the noting? Councillor Alan Rainey, MBE in the Chamber. A seconder. Councillor Paul Stevenson via WebEx. Okay, all agreed. Thank you. So your hand's still up there, Councillor Crawford. Do you wish to come in? Lord. Okay. I think that's you uh, complete now, Louise. Yep. Thank you, Chair, and apologies for uh, not putting my video to work. Thank you. Apologies. Thanks. Uh, item 6.5 now, folks, and we're to consider the minutes of the audit panel meeting held on the 13th of December 2022, and it's paper F, and it's uh, Catherine Leonard is joining us. 
Thank you. Good evening, Chair, and good evening, um, members. So this report is seeking the adoption of the Policy and Resources Committee approval of the audit panel meeting, which took place on the 13th of December. The meeting minutes are attached at Appendix 1, and they are supported by two additional appendices. And Appendix 2 is the Northern Ireland Audit Office report in relation to the performance improvement audit, and the Appendix 3, which is also on the Council's website, in line with regulation relates to the annual audit letter for 21-22, which really is an uh, extract of data and information that has been included in the Council's annual financial statements of account. Members will note under 2.2 other elements considered at the audit panel meeting. So, Chair, subject to any queries, it's recommended that the Council adopts the minutes of the audit panel meeting of the 13th of December. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Catherine. Uh, now we're going to the adoption of the report, and I know Councillor Green is the chair, so Councillor Green's coming on via Webex. Uh, thank you, Chair. I would like to propose the minutes. Uh, okay, you're proposing adoption. Thanks, Councillor Green. And up next is Councillor Bernice Swift. Yeah, Gormaga Kirlock, and I will uh, second the adoption of the minutes. And I would also just to like to put on record the sad news that we did hear about a colleague who used to attend our audit panel meetings over the years, Don Johnson from Deloitte, very sadly passed away at the first week in January following a short illness. And uh, we all offer our sincere condolences to Dawn's family and all of her colleagues at this very sad time. She was one lovely lady and was very forthright with us on our uh, deliberations on audit. So we were very sad to hear all of that news. So just to put it on record that we most sincerely send our condolences to all. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Swift, for uh, obviously raising that issue as well. Thank you. And we're all agreed. Okay, Councillor Green, if you can lower your hand, please. Thank you. And now we're going to uh, reports for information. And it's item seven. And it's the Chief Executive's Directorate Report, uh, 7.1 to note miscellaneous report from Chief Executive. Paper G, Chief Executive. Uh, thank you, Chair. And as you've indicated, just for noting, happy to take any queries, members, but two items within this report. Firstly, uh, a summary of the actions undertaken, the status update of those for both the Council Special Council and Policy and Resources Committee meeting for the period from um, September to December 2022. And the second item, we had been asked to prepare uh, details of correspondence issued in relation to the uh, escorting of uh, explosives for mining and associated activities. And you'll see from the report that the Council has first engaged in this matter formally in December 2021. In the intervening period, we've sent 22 letters. All bar two have been responded to. So that's the information, Chair. OK, and I suppose we, we knew that would have been the case, but uh, it seems quite extensive now. It definitely does. A lot of work has been put into it. So I, I think we have to commend our, our chief executive and officers at all levels for that for that for all that work. Uh, and we have a proposer and seconder that we note. Okay, coming up first is Councillor Victor Warrington. You're proposing, uh, seconded by Councillor Mary Gardy. And we're agreed. Okay, thank you for that. On to uh, item eight, and it's Corporate Services and Governance Directorate Reports. At 8.1 is to note the report on financial matters, paper H, and again it's over to Catherine Leonard. Catherine? Yep, thank you, Chair. And as, as you had indicated, this report is for noting under only. Um, apologies there. So the first item there is the um, Department for Communities Rate Support Grant Award. Members will, will recall after a number of meetings, I have been reporting that we hadn't received any confirmation of the allocation of the budget and noting members the disappointment that the budget has been reduced by 25 percent on the previous year so that's the budget for the entire um, councils that are in receipt of rate support grant and noting the impact there that it has on uh, our own council's perspective and noting um, i suppose in a, in a positive manner that the council included 600,000 only 
in the estimates and the amount receivable in the actual year is £601,394, so a deficit there of 1394 It could have been a much worse position, but really noting the disappointment of the reduction of 25% and what, that, what the impact on that might be on future years as well. The second item there is in relation to the Department for Communities um, capitalisation direction update, and that's really a technical treatment of um, various items of expenditure that have been treated as capital. In relation to item 2.3 members, it's and 2.4 together, it's noting the work undertaken to date by the elected member working group for the estimates process for 23-24, having held two meetings on 5th of December and on the 16th of January. And linked to that meeting then was a presentation from Land and Property Services in relation to the non-domestic revaluation exercise for businesses within the entire NA region and the link, link there to where that information is available on, on the council website and the LPS website as well, that's Land and Property Services. So members, just to note the update from the Department for Communities for the Rate Support Grant and the capitalisation direction, and to note the estimates and rate setting process for 23-24 and the Land and Property Services issue of the schedule of draft business values for the rating year commencing the 1st of April 23. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks very much, Catherine, for, for that report uh, and great work as well. First of all, we go to the Chamber and it's uh, Councillor Barry McAdoff. Okay, uh, thank you, Gorham uh, uh Chair. Um, obviously, if uh, the report needs to be adopted, you know, I, I'll propose that it be adopted in that way. Um, but can I say that um, an interesting uh, piece of information has come to light this evening that uh, five political party leaders have met recently with Nilga, sorry, five representatives of representatives of the five parties, but following on from that meeting between the representatives and Nilga, uh, Michelle O'Neill, Geoffrey Donaldson, Naomi Long, Doug Beatty and Colm Eastwood have co-signed a letter to uh, the permanent secretary uh, Colin Boyle in the Department for Communities, and they've copied in um, Chris Heaton Harris, uh, the British Secretary of State. And the letter is helpful. Um, it says that um, with the utmost urgency, there needs to be an increase in support allocated to councils uh, through the rate support grant. It details that councils are at the forefront of providing public services and employment but have been devastated by the ongoing cost of living crisis and soaring energy prices. And it notes that councils, including our council, currently we are exploring ways and means of keeping the rates increases as low as possible. Um, rates uh, as low as possible, rates increases as low as possible. That's uh, my words on, on, on what they have said in their letter. And that meeting recently took place with Nilga involving the five parties. So. They discussed the impact of increased inflation, payroll pressures, energy costs, and capital costs. And again, as in Catherine's note, um, there it talks about the disparity in support levels offered in 2021 and 21 22, you know, totaling over 20 million, uh, you know, was the figure. But uh, the current quantum that's been offered is 8.924 million. And it notes that the RSG, the rate support grant, is statutory, but the quantum, you know, is discretionary. The amount is discretionary. And if this is not addressed, then the leader's letter says that the shortfall will ultimately be paid for by people already struggling. So their ask uh, is that there should be an immediate short term financial intervention and assistance provided to all councils in the region and that. Uh, the rates support grant should be restored to recent year levels so that uh, this would offer help to the councils and would support rate payers through this difficult time. So, Chair, consistent with that, I'm proposing that this council write a similar letter um, making the same points, uh, detailing our difficulties, our challenges, um, to Colin Boyle, the Permanent Secretary of the Department for Communities, and copy in Chris Heaton Horace as well. 
So I make that proposal, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, first of all, have we got a seconder for that uh, proposal? And I, I see Councillor Walters coming on here. And are you prepared to second the adoption of the report as well, Councillor Walters? Yeah, I'm prepared to uh, second the adoption of the report and also second Councillor Michael Duff's um, proposal there to write to the Department for Communities. Um, as he's clearly outlined there, all the points are made by the party leaders. And there's no doubt that we as a council will be under more significant financial pressure and then for directly the ratepayers as well. Um, so I would support that call for an urgent intervention to increase the rate support grant to benefit everybody. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much, Councillor Wilders. Um, back into the chamber again now, we have Councillor Stephen Donnelly. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, sorry, for just for clarity, is this uh, being addressed to the UK government or to the Department for Communities, this correspondence? I'll let Councillor Bickle Duff in here again. You want to come in again? The letter is written to the Department for Communities, but it's copied in uh, to Chris Heaton Harris. Yeah. State. yeah. No, uh, thank you, Chair. No, I mean, I think that's um, an eminently uh, sensible proposal, and I'm more than happy to support it. I suppose it, it does come with the caveat that it should not be necessary, and that this political vacuum where people's lives are suffering at present is totally unacceptable. But given the drastic situation that we are and I think that it is right and appropriate that we as an authority do seek to exert every pre pressure possible to ensure that we get uh, whatever funding necessary to be able to deliver for the services and needs of the people in Fermanagh and Oma. So with that caveat, I'm more than happy to offer my support, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Donnelly. And now we go to WebEx. And first up, we have Councillor Dr. Josephine Dayton. Thank you, Chair. And I want to thank uh, Catherine for her report. And uh, our thanks go to Catherine and her team uh, for all the work that they've put in in recent months um, to bring us to this point. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's quite unbelievable, actually, Chair, that uh, we see our rate support grant reduced by 25 percent compared with the previous year. And this coming at a time of unprecedented demand uh, on uh, the financial position of the council and the uh, impact uh, on service delivery and also on our ratepayers. So I thank Councillor Michael Duff for uh, uh, informing us this evening of this initiative that has been taken uh, by the five main parties in Northern Ireland uh, in conjunction with NILGA. And I think it does highlight, Chair, uh, that the political parties uh, do recognise the crucial role that councils play in supporting the population through what are unprecedented, uh, very, very difficult times. So I, I do hope that uh, uh, this appeal uh, by the main parties and also by this council uh, will not fall on deaf ears. Surely there has to be some rationale and logic and common sense applied uh, when it comes to uh, providing uh, financial support to councils by central government. I think it's very, very short sighted of uh, the permanent secretary for the Department for Communities to actually cut the rate support grant. And uh, I do hope that he will uh, reconsider in the light of the representations that he has had. So happy uh, to support uh, Catherine's paper, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Dehan. And next up, probably last speaker on this issue, is Councillor Robert Irvine, via WebEx. Thank you very much, Chair. No, I agree and uh, support the initiative and the proposal by Councillor Michael Duff uh, and the comments uh, coming forward from other councillors. One, if not two, observations. If we are successful and some sort of funding is reinstated and increased, to be effective in the long term, it would need to be recurrent. So therefore, instated completely and not withdrawn the following year. Because all that will do will be give us temporary uh, leeway this year going into the next sort of financial year. But if it comes back to current levels, we will be in the same position 12, 14 months down the line. 
and we will have to uh, gather the rates from somewhere. So happy to support, but I think the caveat should be made if Councillor Michael Duff uh, was willing, that this should be a permanent reinstatement of the reduction um, that has taken place over these last number of years to be effective. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Irvine, for your comments. And I, I've got the nod from Councillor McIntosh that he's happy with that. And that was obviously seconded by Councillor Withers, and he's happy as well. OK, it's been proposed and seconded for the adoption of the report. And then it's been proposed and seconded uh, again to write to Colin Boyle, uh, Permanent Secretary of the Department for Communities, and CC the Secretary of State into this matter. All agreed? OK, thanks for that, Catherine. OK, and now we're on to 8.2, and it's to note a report on procurement and tenders update, paper A. Again, it's over to Catherine Leonard. Catherine. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, for information only, members, uh, there are six tenders recently awarded in line with um, the procurement policy and, and delegation from 2.1.1 up to 2.1.6. And the other small element, just for noting on this paper, Chair, is a collaborative procurement. Um, the Council being part of the Northern Ireland Wide Electric Vehicle Consortium, um, details of which were presented to the Council's Environmental Services Committee in October 22, and just moving on with that collaborative procurement. So the recommendations, Chair, are that the tenders awarded are de detailed, as detailed, sorry, within this report are noted, and the collaborative procurement for electric charging vehicle points as part of the Northern Ireland Wide Electric Vehicle Consortium are noted. OK, thanks very much, that, Catherine. And um, back in the chamber now, and we have Councillor Stephen Donnelly. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, I'm more than happy to uh, propose the recommendations in the report. I suppose just a brief uh, question. I mean, certainly over the course of the last year, I mean, with a huge amount happening, um, particularly with disruptions to supply chains and the increase in the price of resources and all the rest of it, quite often uh, whenever we got uh, things such as, such as this back, the, the actual tender ended up being very usually more expensive than the pre-tender estimate, whereas in this occasion, I think the majority of the tenders actually ended up being cheaper than the pre-tender estimate. And I suppose, just is this maybe just a one-off, or is there any particular comment on that? Okay, Catherine? Yeah, so through the chair, I suppose typically over, over the past year, and I suppose we were referring to this earlier on today, internally, you know, from April, Last year, right through to September, October, there were significant increases and uh, really hard, I suppose, for, for those teams um, to, involved in, in actually pricing to get the price, the pre-tender estimate, as we refer to, in or around and really trying to keep up with the volatility in the financial markets. So, yes, this is the, the first report in a number of months where it's for information only and, um, you know, stabilisation there in terms of, you know, maybe the, 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 the movements in the inflationary rates albeit still very, very high, have slowed month on month from the time the pre-tender estimate was undertaken to the actual tender receipt of documents. Um, and that would be the, the main rationale behind that. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, now over to uh, Chamber again, and we have Councillor Matthew Bell. Uh, thank you, Chair, and I'm quite happy to second the recommendations. But just a, <clears throat> just as a comment, um, I am very happy to, to see that all the, the businesses mentioned in this report are all local. If they're not from from Anonym itself, they're very close and just shows Tyrone's ready for business, doesn't it? Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Bell. And we had uh, Councillor Irvine, but he's put his hand down there. So uh, we're all agreed with the adoption of the report. Thank you. And now we're on to item 8.3, and it's to note report on staff matters. And it's paper J. First of all, thanks to Catherine Leonard for her contribution this evening. And now we're on to oh, Thelma Brown coming on now by WebEx. Hey, Thelma. 8.3. Good, Good evening, Chair and members. Just checking you can hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay, thank you. So this is just a very short report, Chair, for noting um, two items. First item is the Local Government Staff Commission easing. Uh, which is attached in Appendix 1. And then the second item, Chair, um, is just in relation to our employee recognition event, which took place on the 16th of December. Um, and Chair, if you'll allow me just to expand briefly on that, um, 
we had approximately 100 current and former employees who were recognized at that event. And we returned to an in-person event for the first time in three years. So it was a very positive event with winners um, consisting of, we had four teams from across the council recognized in awards, and we had four individual employees who received recognition awards. Um, as I say, it was a broad spectrum of nominations and we included some very new employees who've been a short time with the council and some very long serving employees. So Chair, I would, I'm sure that members would want to agree and pass on congratulations to everyone and we have included the link there for members who wish to view the booklet and the uh, details of the winners so those two items just for noting chair if that's okay thanks very much uh Thelma, for that before bring commissioner michael duff and i just want to make a quick comment i had the pleasure of doing that ceremony last year albeit online for the, the vast majority and it just wasn't my way of doing things but uh I have to congratulate Councillor Michael Duff and commend him this year for having the, you know, for being allowed to do it properly. So I'll bring him in at this stage. Yeah, Earl, you would understand it's a significant event. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, just to agree with Thelma, um, it was a very pleasant duty and it served as a reminder that we have very talented people and very committed people who have given lengthy and valuable service to this council and by extension to the local community. And it is important to recognise those people. And I was privileged to join with the chief executive in presenting those awards. And uh, for those who missed out in the competitive nature of things, you know, there is no appeal process. There is no appeal. Pro There's no European appeal process. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Miguelov. And next up by Webex, we have Councillor Robert Irvine. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, yes, I would echo both your comments, both yourself and the current chair. It's extremely good. I've been to several of them over the years, and it's um, a showcase to actually say thank you from the uh, executive team, heads of service, and from us councillors to everybody within the organisation, how much they actually put into the organisation, because those employees are the face of the organization and they actually make or break our reputation. And over the past number of years, particularly through COVID, they have made the reputation of the council. Yes, you'll always have moaners out there in the wider community, but you're never going to get rid of them. We, we all know that they'll moan no matter what it is. They'll moan for the sake of a moaning. So I'm happy to actually uh, second the, the noting of that and well done Thelma for doing everything and well done Barry. Thank you. Thank you and thanks for that Councillor Brain. Thank you again Thelma for all your work on that matter. Thank you. Councillor Swift, I'm going to bring you in here. Ah, uh, yeah, just very quickly and just to concur with everything that's already been said. And thank you very much, Thelma. The whole Employee Recognition Award so well deserved and so well displayed on the staff hub. I just loved reading it and I love the whole sparkly stars coming out of the paper. It's fantastic and very well done to the 17 employees who were recognised for 20 years of service. Like, that's just amazing. And then the rest of the employees, 10 more recognised for 30 years service with the Council. It's just fantastic uh, all together and great to see Margaret and uh, a few of the familiar faces, all the ladies getting all their well-deserved and well-achieved um, presentations. It's just fantastic and uh, no appeal necessary. Witty as always, Barry, with that one. So uh, I'll just do my wee congratulations there now, my wee celebrations uh, uh, emoji. So well done to all. Thank you very much, Thelma. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Swift. And thank you, Thelma. For now, I know you're back on later. Thank you. Okay, we're going now to item nine and as correspondence and we have uh, Chief Executive, if you just want to speak on this one. Yeah, well, thank you, Chair. Chair. We have three items of correspondence all in the other folder. Uh, the first item is from uh, received yesterday. It's on behalf of for Fermanagh Women's Aid and it's in, in relation to their conference uh, event where the blame lies, and that will take place on the 8th and 9th of March at the Loch Aran Resort. Um, the prices for that chair, single day, ticket £90, two day event £150 and, and travel costs then if necessary. Okay, uh, I suppose first of all, we'll have a proposal and seconder to note the correspondence. Proposed by Councillor Alan Rainey, MBE, 
And we have a seconder, Councillor Mary Garrity is seconding. Okay. And any nomination, I suppose we need, we need nominations, if any, uh, for, for this conference. Councillor Tommy McGuire, BioWebEx. Bio Councillor McGuire. And Guru Magadu uh, I believe that I, I, uh, Councillor uh, Debbie Coyle would like to attend that conference if possible, Chair. I'd recommend. Okay, Councillor Debbie Coyle. Councillor Bertie Swift. Yeah, I wish, wish to attend also, Guru Magad. Okay, we're, we're going to uh, the chamber now, and we have Councillor Anne MBE. Councillor Barton, uh, on the chair, please. Councillor Barton. Councillor McGuire, uh, are you prepared to, uh, pro or happy to, to propose Councillor Coyle, Councillor Swift and Councillor Barton? Yes, quite happy to propose all, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, and now we'll bring Councillor Robert Irvine in. Thank you, Chair. I'll happily second all those nominees. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, and we're all agreed. Okay. Chief Executive. Thank you, Chair. Chair, the second item of correspondence we have referred to earlier in the meeting. It's a, just from the Chief Executive of the Trust setting out the consultation arrangements for the um, a temporary withdrawal of emergency general services. It's really just a formal proposal and second or now to know, Chair, we obviously have the actions have uh, from the earlier part of the meeting. Proposed by Councillor Alan Rainey, MBA, seconded by Councillor Matthew Bell in the Chamber. Okay. Thank you. Yes. And we have a third piece, sir. Yes, Chair, Chair, just received earlier today, and this is from the Department for Infrastructure, and this is the further consultation on the supplementary information to the environmental statement addendum relating to the A5. Uh, it's really just setting out the arrangements for the publication and access to the report chair. You'll see that it is available and may be inspected from the 18th of January to the 3rd of March at the various locations specified and the notice is included uh, with the correspondence. So uh, the councils previously made representations. We obviously have the motion on this chair, so we'll be making further representations of support and uh, just at this stage requesting members to note the correspondence. Thank you very much, Chief Executive. And now we're going to the Chamber with Councillor Patrick Withers. Yeah, thank you, Chair, and uh, welcome to the additional information that's been uh, put forward by the Department of Infrastructure and uh, open the consultation. I know that this was highlighted by uh, the Planned Appeals Commission in the mid-inquiry there in November, so with the continuous legal challenges from the Alternative A5 Alliance, I think it's important that uh, the Department do everything they can to get this project over the line, so leave no stone unturned. Um, I also want to take this opportunity to encourage people to attend the Tyrone GA's campaign group um, launch next Monday night. Enough is enough um, for day five. So that's next Monday night, 23rd January in Gervai at half seven. And there's more information on the Tyrone GA social media challenges on that. Chair, thank you. Okay, so you're proposing to note a lot of your comments. Yeah, okay. Are we, are we going to second it for noting? Councillor Alan Rainey, MBE, is seconding the noting. And that is brings the correspondence to a close. Thank you for that. Yep. Uh, I had one notification from uh, Councillor Adam Gannon for item 10 and the urgent relevant business, but he's happy enough. Uh, he's going to correspond with our chief executive, that matter. And I think you're happy enough, yes? Chair, I don't know if the, if, um, the chief executive saw my, my last. Um, communication there. I think it may be worth yes. flagging, but it's up to yourself, Chair, if you um, feel that it's, it's oh, he's, going through now. I'm taking advice, I'm taking advice Councillor Gallon, uh, Chief Executive says she's happy enough, and she'll uh, discuss further with you in the first instance. No problem, if necessary. I'll come back to you next month. Thanks, Chair. A question? A question for the Chief Executive? Okay, uh, I'll let you in on this one, Councillor Bell. Thank you for allowing me the latitude there, Chair. Um, I appreciate you have to be in before 6 p.m., but uh, I want to ask a question about an event that happened earlier in the meeting um, where you unfortunately had to silence um, three uh, members. And I suppose sitting here, you know, as someone who always waits his turn and takes his three minutes, and as well as every other councillor in the room with me and many on WebEx do the same, I, I would just wish to ask um, Al, or the Chief Executive, 
at what point do we report um, individuals to the ombudsman? At what point do we have the grounds to do that? Because it's, it's happening at every meeting, and I, I, I don't think I'm the only one who's sick of it. Um, so if that question will be answered, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bell, Chief Executive. Yeah, well, uh, I think the answer, Chair, really is it is up to members. I mean, uh, implicit or not implicit, explicit in the Code of Conduct, uh, there's mutual respect, there's communications, there's harmonious working relationships, all of those things. Um, so it is it is a matter entirely for members at which at what point they would choose to lodge a complaint to the commissioner, either individually or uh, on wider groupings. Uh, if the suggestion or the request is when the council itself would complain or choose to make a complaint, we would require a proposer and seconder to do so. Um, I suppose the second element that I would would advise chair. There is um, obviously within the code of conduct, and I, I, I'm very conscious sometimes in our own meetings that uh, particularly if people are, are listening or watching in. So the standing orders are the adopted rules by which the meeting operates. We're frequently quoting standing orders uh, as part of that. They're published and they're available. Um, but certainly uh, uh, what could be described as a willful breach of standing orders is in itself perhaps worthy of, of consideration uh, by the commissioner or others as to whether it is a breach of the code. But the short answer is, Chair, it's entirely up to members whether at what point to proceed and if they wish to proceed. If it is the request the council corporately does so, that would come through the normal proposer, seconder and the associated actions. Thank you, Chief Executive. Mr. Bell, question third. If it's appropriate to do so now, I would like to propose we take those actions because, Chair, honestly, the, the way you were spoken to earlier was disgraceful. And some of the claims made about yourself was disgraceful, and I'm sick of it. It's happening at every meeting, and it's it's simply not on. So if I can propose that, thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Councillor Bell. You've heard everyone uh, in the chamber and via WebEx. I've heard Councillor Bell. I'm going to bring a couple of people in here via WebEx here now, and we have first of all Councillor Dr. Josephine Dehan. Well, thank you, Chair, and. Uh... I suppose I, I feel uh, uh, quite uncomfortable with the events of this evening and uh, I appreciate your role as chair and uh, I, I have no doubt uh, that, you know, in conducting your business as chair, you, you are fair. I do recognise, however, uh, that, you know, the members who were silenced, you know, they are elected representatives and they do um, feel very passionate on 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 certain issues and uh, you know I, I think in the round overall the three councillors do make a, a very important points and make a, a, a very valuable contribution uh, to council meetings and uh, I suppose it is regrettable that their passions really uh, 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 allow them to sort of lose the run of themselves and uh, I appreciate the, the decision that you took today. I certainly would not be in support of Councillor Bell's uh, proposal. Um, I think that, um, you know, I hopefully the councillors will have received a message this evening, uh, but I certainly don't think that this is an offence which is grave enough uh, to be taking it further. So I, I certainly wouldn't be supportive of that proposal, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dehan. Uh, just to, and it, can I just make it clear at the outset, I've said this many times before, I'm in the chair, I'm a fair chair, and, you know, if anybody's bad-mattered to anyone in this chamber, they will be pulled into line by myself, and that's if they're talking to me or if they're talking to another council colleague. It's, it's unacceptable, and when people keep persisting at the matter, well, actions, actions will be taken by myself, no matter who that is, and no matter what party they are, or if they're independents. And uh, I'll just uh, go to item or number 25, standing order 25, and some members' conduct. 25.1 says, speaking through the chair, when a member speaks at the council, they must address the meeting through the chairperson. More than one member wishes to speak, the chairperson will ask one to speak and will allow the other members to speak in turn. And item 
following on from that is 25.2, and it's the chairperson standing. When the chairperson speaks during a debate, any member speaking at that time must stop. The meeting must be silent. And the 25.3, member not to be heard further. If at a meeting, any member of the council must conduct himself or herself by persistently disregarding the ruling of the chair or behaving irregularly and properly or offensively or by willfully obstructing the business of the council, the chairperson or any other member may move that the member named be not further heard. The motion, if seconded, shall be put and determined without discussion. So I hope that clarifies the position for all. And if I'm on the floor, I respect the chair, regardless of who they are, what party they come from, and I, I don't see any, any issue in that. Uh, other councillors want to come on here. Uh, Councillor Bernice Swift, via Webex. Edgar Maggot Cahirla, just very briefly, and I hear and understand all the standing orders loudly and clearly uh, with 18 years of experience of it indeed, and I fully understand. Uh, it is unfortunate what has happened this evening, but I totally concur with Councillor Dehan uh, with her, of what she has expressed explicitly here this evening. I fully object uh, to any complaint going forward. I do think it's unfortunate, and you know, I would point out uh, perhaps also uh, Kihirlok, Councillor Bell has come in this evening um, and not adhered to the guidelines and the etiquette indeed and bounced the AOB as well. Um, so, you know, um, fair play is bonnie play as well as I always say, but um, please um, note I am totally objecting to any complaint going forward in this instance, but we would hope to see some harmony certainly at our next month's meeting, Gurmagat. Well, I would certainly hope so, Councillor Swift. Uh, just with regard to Councillor Bell coming in, he did ask for initial clarification from the Chief Executive, and that's why I allowed him to come out at that time. So I hope that clarifies the position. Uh, it was my decision to allow him to ask for clarification from our Chief Executive. Councillor Robert Irvine, via Webex. Sorry, uh, Chair, thank you very much indeed. Um, look, I'm happy to come in and second Councillor Bell's proposal. Um, I do understand the sentiments expressed by the previous councillors, Councillor Deacon and Swift, and I understand there is an issue. Um, we all want to have people to have equal access, give everyone opportunity to speak their mind, but we work within a framework this unfortunately is a pattern of behaviour by these three individuals. It's not just a one off. It has happened on numerous other occasions um, over the last number of years. It's becoming particularly more aggressive uh, in these last couple of months. And every chair, particularly yourself and a few other chairs, warn about adhering to standing orders. And there is complete abeyance, complete ignorance just going forward. So I think time has come to draw a line, and I'm happy with the proposal going forward. We need to actually take a stand for those councillors that actually obey and follow the rules as set down. So thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Irvine. Uh, next up, Councillor Tommy McGuire, BioWebEx. Uh, Margaret Kearley, thanks for that. Uh, again, I'd have to agree that uh, this issue has been slightly bounced in here on AOB and uh, I would have uh, reservations about us proceeding in, in, in such a fashion. Uh, we're, we are all, or we should, I, I correct myself, we should all be aware of the standing orders with regards to jumping in and, to, and speaking on top of other members. Uh, I suffered it for long enough myself uh, while I, carrying out a duty as chair. But I still feel that there is enough within our standing orders to take uh, appropriate action, like, uh, as I say, remove from a meeting, etc. But the 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 ogre of the ombudsman has been used quite widely through this last period in council. Uh, I, three or four, I think, is my tally at the minute. Uh, it causes a lot of stress on members. 
because the length of time it takes for the duty to be carried out, six months or maybe longer, and you're continually, whereas you may not wake up every morning worrying about the ombudsman and a, and a, and a complaint about your actions in the council chamber, I still feel that it's a, it's a drastic action. It's not something I would do personally. I think we should utilize the standing orders that are available to us as chairs, uh, as stands within the council. Uh, again, uh, putting petrol on the fire at this stage, uh, we are all aware that elections are imminent. We know what people are doing. Uh, we're not silly. So uh, I would be very hesitant to support the proposal of Councillor Bell. I do believe that uh, we should retract from that and that we should assert the Stanton orders and every chair should apply them. Uh, and I think uh, fair play to the chair last night, he did uh, accordingly and yourself tonight, Chair. I think uh, just maybe what Councillor Bell is suggesting is a little bit too drastic. Uh, he, I know he's fairly fresh into the chamber, but we have been suffering this for quite a while. But I still think we should utilise our own standing orders and not be uh, going down the line of reporting officially to the Ombudsman. I, I, I think it's an undue stress on councillors, regardless of their actions. That's my opinion, Chair Gormagat. Thank you very much, Councillor McGuire. Uh, next up, we have Councillor Mary Gardy, BioWebEx. Um, thank you, Chair. And uh, in relation to this item, as I say, which we weren't aware of coming, I, I feel that I do need the need to speak. And to be honest, within our group, and they might be torn in the issue of which way to go. But I know the Ombudsman, um, in previous occasions, when it has been needed to report things, um, the result has been um, poor. Um, after an arduous um, length of time, um, as Tommy Maguire, Councillor Maguire said, it often takes a long time. Um, some people can get anxious about it. As someone who's been on the receiving end, I wasn't one bit anxious at any stage on numerous occasions. However, um, my point is, councillors mentioned the passion that these individuals have, but the speaking over of Councillor Green and your chef chair wasn't acceptable. Um, I understand, and I myself have come falling to passion at times and may have stepped in and it'd be a very, very rare occasion, but this does happen a lot. And the question is, how often do we let it go? My suggestion would be, and I refer to football because it's what we know best as a referee. Um, I think three strikes and you're out isn't necessarily the way to go. If this rule was used uh, as, uh, as a red card, as it could be used on the first instance where um, an incident takes place at a meeting. I think if that was done once or twice, it might eradicate this behaviour for all councillors um, that might be speaking in in future, that there's a, a zero tolerance to this not going through the chair. And that would go for myself or for the members excluded or indeed anyone else still on here. I think that really is the way forward, that all chairs adopt a consistent procedure um, regarding this rule in particular. And when someone speaks over someone else, and especially the chair, that this rule is invoked right away and, and that might stop bad behaviour. It's not something nobody wants anyone to be silenced, but it would stop this carry on that others have referenced is going on too much. Um, I have no faith in the Ombudsman system, so um, I won't be supporting the proposal. However, I would ask Clarity and the Chief Executive of your Chef Chair, um, I would understand that if the member, um, Councillor Bell, wants to uh, report this as a councillor, I would think he would have um, the ability to do so, seconded by whomever he has, just if that was still an option for the member, because indeed he's entitled to his opinion. Um, it's just, I think, regardless of, of, of a report, I think nothing much would come, come with it, because there's been even, believe it or not, even more serious allegations that have went through this council previously to an ombudsman. And as I say, the report back was more than disappointing. And at that report, it was um, insinuations, again, officers uh, and uh, directors at that stage, and it fell on deaf ears. So um, someone interrupted in the chair of, of, of a committee like ourselves, I don't think would, 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 have, would go very far. But I just want clarity, if the member did still want to pursue this to the Ombudsman, could they do it individually? Because like I say, if that's their wishes, it's their entitlement. But from we will not be supporting just the pros of the stands. Very little faith in the system. But going forward, use the referee's approach as a right away, invoke that standing order. And whoever it is who is misbehaving in the chamber should be removed. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Gurley, for comments. I'll bring the Chief Executive on maybe at this stage to clarify. Yes, uh, Chair, just to, to confirm um, Councillor Garrett, he's 
uh, query or position is correct. So first of all, anyone, it doesn't have to be an elected member. Any individual may make a complaint regarding an, a, a councillor's conduct. It, 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 I should also clarify, it doesn't need a, a, any supporting uh, a seconder or anything like that. So any individual, including a councillor, can make a, a complaint on their own behalf and that doesn't require any formal council approvals. OK, thank you. Chief uh, Secretary. And the Chamber now, and we have uh, Councillor Stephen Donnelly. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. And I suppose I do approach this with um, a certain amount of trepidation, uh, not merely as uh, an, an Alliance councillor, but as a single party uh, councillor in this chamber, in the sense that in the past I have unfortunately witnessed those partic some particular individuals in the larger parties willing to cast these criticisms on independents and single party members, but willing to turn a blind eye to similar behaviour in their own parties. So that gives me a degree of nervousness. I also think that we have to be very aware of the fact that this particular tool, in terms of using the council, I think is a deeply drastic tool and is only to be used in the most extreme of circumstances. And we have to realise that given some of the challenges that we face as a community right now, there's going to be heated and passionate debates within this chamber. And actually, Chair, tonight I think you've actually demonstrated that with the standing orders, you have the tools at your disposal to be able to ensure in those extreme circumstances where things go a little bit too far, that you're able to continue and maintain the orderliness of the meeting. And I do have to say that it is rare that it has come to that point. Yes, we've had heated and passionate debates in the past, but it is rare that it has actually come to the point where we've had to actually eject that many people at once. And I think that's also a fervor issue that I have a deep amount of concern about, which is that I think that everybody um, should be treated on an individual basis with their actions and their track record being assessed on that individual basis. And on this occasion, we're being asked to cast a judgment on three people at once at very short notice. And that gives me great concern, Chair. So. At this point, I would not be in any position whatsoever to support the proposal by Councillor Bell. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Councillor Donnelly. Uh, okay, via WebEx, Councillor Victor Warrington. Thank you, Chair. Well, you know, I've listened to the previous speakers and I, I, I'm not going to agree with a lot of what they said. Um, certainly, uh, there, there, uh, there is a lot of repetitiveness in this. Uh, where it's been going on for a, a, a long, a long uh, number of years now, where a particular councillors are coming in and interrupting the chairs. Uh, Councillor Maguire alluded to when he was in the chair, and yes, you as a chair has the tools to be able to 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 silence these individuals. Um, but you know, it has to be obviously done uh, in a more firmer fashion now. So to so that when they're when they're um when they are silenced or whatever they, they get one warning uh, and not allow the situation to proceed because we've seen tonight we've seen last night we've seen over the last few weeks um warnings don't seem to to be adhered to uh, and they, they continue to do it so I leave my comments at that thank you. Thank you, Councillor Warrington. Bring Councillor Bell just back in for comment. Uh, thank you, Chair, to let me back in. And uh, as, as, and um, I suppose the point's been made. And thank you for letting this conversation flow. Does everyone notice there how respectful that conversation was, even though there was disagreement? And I think it went very well. And I hope the people who chair various committees listened in and heard the the willingness of this chamber for more firmer actions when people do interrupt, because as other speakers did allude, it is a trend. Um, there was a few comments made there, I think by Sinn Féin and the SDLP, that they did accept that this is a, a trend now. And the, my question will be for Sinn Féin and the SDLP, if not now, when? When will we draw the line on this? Uh, but with all that said, I think I've made my point and I'm happy to withdraw the proposal. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. You're withdrawing it then. And I see uh, Councillor Robert Irvine is. Are you going to speak, or Councillor Irvine? Yes, please, Chair. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, I, I 
Judging by the debate that has taken place and the comments already made by the proposer, Councillor Bell, I will agree to withdraw my seconding, but with one caveat. I think a line has been crossed by these councillors. And in future, if chairs actually issue uh, etiquette warnings going forward, let it be known that I and the other members of my party will be coming in for exclusion because due warning has been given and laid down and therefore the chairs will be helped by our party as I'm sure they will be by your party to exclude this ignorant behaviour because that's all it is. It's ignorance in the raw sense of the word. So thank you very much, Chair, for letting me speak again. Thank you, Councillor Irving. And uh, just uh, and I see Councillor Gardy's coming on there again. And just before Councillor Gardy comes on, can I just say, you know, uh, I said it in my opening remarks this evening, and every, every time I've been in a chair, whether that, whether that be the chair of the council or the chair of the Policy and Resources Committee, I've laid it down in my preliminary remarks. Respect the chair, respect each other. Basically, don't speak over each other. Uh, we've, as Councillor Bell has referred to it there, we've had a, a, an issue there and we've discussed it and we've come to a conclusion on it, hopefully now. I, I don't want to see this happen again because it's in no one's interest that it goes out to uh, in the wider public and they'll say, what's anybody watching on this? They'll say, what are you doing on there? You know, and uh, that's not the way we work. I try to be a fair and professional individual in everything that I do. So thank you for that. Professor Mary Gardy, you still your hand up. Do you want to speak? Thank you, Chair. I'm very brief and I got to agree with you. You do set your stall out well and clear at the start of every meeting and do a great job. But just um, to reply to Councillor Bell, because he did ask the question of, um, I think, Sinn Féin and my own party, the SDLP, and if not, when, I think was the question, or, or when is a suitable time. And as I did um, point out in my report there and looked clarity from the Chief Executive, um, if the Councillor Bell believes the time is right now, he has still got that um, remit within his power, so I'm sure he, he picked up on that. And um, I made it clear why my faith in the Ombudsman, just at the stage why we wouldn't pursue and support his proposal, but I'm um, just to make it clear to him that if he believes the time is right, that's entirely a, um, a decision for the member. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Gardy, and I'll allow one more speaker on that, and that's uh, Councillor Seamus Green, BioWebX. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, I appreciate this conversation. I, uh, I note what happened earlier on uh, was attack, an attack on myself. Uh, I think, uh, uh, as somebody alluded to there, uh, just pure bad manners and ignorance that uh, people uh, continually I mean, now any of us can have an odd off day and we can uh, uh, come in, uh, maybe uh, we shouldn't, but as someone said there, this is a trend. And also a councillor mentioned there previously that it's becoming uh, worse now and it's becoming more aggressive. Uh, I think we all know why this is. Uh, there's an election coming up in May, so these uh, individuals are trying to make a name for themselves, are trying to uh, castigate the rest of us and uh, uh, to try and stand out because uh, there's an election coming. And that's fair enough, fair enough if they want to do that. But uh, I, I'm not so sure the public out there really wants uh, their councillors just to be as rude and bad-mannered as uh, some of the councillors were tonight. And uh, I appreciate the uh, council for their support and I appreciate uh, uh, Chair the way he handled the events there the night. So I'll just leave it there. Thank you for your remarks, Councillor Green. Thank you. Okay, that's uh, brought that issue to a, a close. Yep. Can we have a proposal and seconder to go into committee for party business? Councillor Stephen Donnelly in the chamber. Seconded by Councillor Rosemary Barton in the Chamber.
and agreed. Okay, Adam. Okay, thank you, Adam. Okay, we're now back, and uh, I'll ask our chief executive to give a quick resume of what took place while some part two business. Okay, Chair, thank you. Um, just to advise Chair while in committee, the Council considered matters arising of the confidential minutes of the meeting held on the 14th of December, and there were no matters arising, and also considered a report for information on confidential staff matters, and the content of that report was noted. Thank you very much, Chief Executive. Can we have a proposal seconder for the adoption? of our Chief Executive Remarks. Okay, Councillor Stephen Donnelly, proposed. Seconded by Councillor Dr. Josephine Dehan. All agreed? Okay, with that, I now bring the meeting to a conclusion. Ended at 9.45 p.m. Thank you for all your attendance and safe home, those who are travelling. Good night, Chair. Good night, everybody.